Hi, Phoebe. Hi, Mark. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have two wonderful poets, Phoebe McAdams and Mark Edward Rhodes, with us today. Phoebe will read first, and then Mark. Phoebe McAdams was born and raised in New York City, but has lived mostly in California. She moved to L.A. in 1986. With the poets James Cushing, the late Holly Prado, and Harry Northup, she is a founding member of Coanga Press. She taught English at Roosevelt High School in Boyle Heights until her retirement in 2011. She has published seven books of poetry, the last five with Coanga Press, including in 2016, her new and selected volume, The Large Economy of the Beautiful. In 2017, Beyond Broke published Every Bird Helps, a Cancer Journal. According to Amelie Frank, quote, what she reports back to us from her daily pilgrimages should give us hope. Truth and beauty are at hand everywhere we look and always just as we need it most, end of quote. She lives in Pasadena with her husband, Ronald Ozuna. In Again Teaching, Phoebe wrote, quote, take words, I say, and learn to make your life with them. Make your barge of words and make it strong, end of quote. She ends, poetry leads me back, quote, it is always the same. The world leads me away, poetry leads me back, end of quote. Phoebe's enlightening and personal poetry, which I love, contains grace, consciousness, light, generosity, and love. A brilliant poet, Phoebe McAdams. Thank you, Harry. That was that was lovely. Thank you. And also, thank you for organizing and hosting this extraordinary poetry reading series. And thank you, Jennifer Clymer and the Creative Chaos team for putting it all together. It has been food for the spirit during these difficult months, and I am privileged to be a part of it. It is a pleasure to be reading with Mark Rhodes, whose poetry I love. He is one of the hidden gems of the LA literary scene. Mm. I will be reading from The Large Economy of the Beautiful, my selected poems, <clears throat> published by Coenga Press. Um, I am deeply grateful to be part of Coenga Press. I'll start with the title poem. And uh, this is a poem about birding. My husband introduced me to birding and it changed my life. The Large Economy of the Beautiful for Ron Ozuna. I am wearing my birding hat and crazy paraphernalia, binos and bottles, no little notebooks and pens as cars whiz by on Highway 1. Today, I have learned about syrinx nymph beloved by Pan, and also the throat muscle and cartilage of bird song. The black skimmer moves along the top of the water trolling for fish. California corm cormorants stand on the sand drying their wings. Willet, wimbrel, dowager and plover, yellow feet, red bills, great blue and snowy white. At night, the shapes of birds move differently. Wings calling us to rise from our daily difficulties and sing ourselves into form. Temperature, 91 degrees. A summer meal in October. Pea soup, chicken salad on sheep herder bread from Schatz Bakery in Bishop. Cucumber from the garden. Today, the impeccable mystery of the daily fruits and bowls, the Norton Simon still lives. Every morning, I open the living room window and let in the early light of Southern California. Here comes Ron making his daily entrance, smiling. <coughs> Ready. Ready. I wrote this not too long after I retired. I am ready for alone. 
I am ready for birds, for poems and sweet silence, for contemplating vegetables. I keep track of what is within, read old journals, broken copy machines and coffee makers, the daily miracles holding us. Uh, this is a poem uh, that makes reference to a kind of poetry called New Formalism. New Formalism is a kind of poetry that involves regular rhythm and regular rhyme. Um, it's a poem that I think take a poem poetry form that I think takes us backwards and very different from the free verse that most of the people I know write in. And Dana Joya, who's quite well known, is one of the practitioners of new formalism. These days are temporary and I praise them. Over a hundred degrees today, yesterday 106. When I didn't go to hear Dana Joya at Vroman's, having read his poems online, new formalism, why would you do that? Tie yourself up in old rhythms, smother the exuberance of Walt, one for us. Today, I contemplate pictures at Avenue 50 Studio, brave images of violence in Mexico, where artists who talk about killing are punished by death. We are fortunate to walk these streets in any meter we choose, and then come home to turkey salad, jumbo artichokes, heirloom tomatoes, frozen blueberry yogurt. I love the food that's available in California. If you go to a grocery store in New York City, it's a very different, sad <laughs> little selection. Rain in Pasadena. Rain in fought Pasadena falls on pansies and blades of grass. I remember early morning sounds of New York City, the comfort of traffic. Now, a little bird song, a little breeze. My grandfather sat on porches and collected hinges in the Hudson Valley, uh, Hudson River Valley, where we went to the Catskill game farm and fed milk in baby bottles to young lambs. What controls our lives? its messiness, its precarious loveliness? Is it memories or the wings of hummingbirds? Is it hinges and light? We do what we can. I'm waiting to see my doctor. Should I be worried? No, he will tell me in his calm and efficient way. Meanwhile, Will gets rerouted around tornadoes in Dallas and the Midwest, arrives in New York 12 hours after leaving LAX. We are not in control of these things. Illness, weather, our friends' lives. Today, I drove to the airport at 6 a.m., came home and read the paper, made beds and brought order to my home. Now I track this day while a Northern mockingbird sings in the early afternoon. Yeah. Efficient suitcases. I mean, we are always traveling like the wild parrots of South Pasadena who arrived here on my first day, now moving from tree to tree, ambassadors of salt, of talk, emissaries of Kamadeva, the exotic God who rides their backs into a future of ranunculus, of pansies, pots of chard and kale, winter guides like polka dot socks or the parrot handled cups from my mother who thinned to the delicacy of bone, dying gracefully one afternoon after ordering groceries. See, eternity again, while sitting on the porch observing the camphor tree, 
Though the blueberry plant is coming back to life, the Japanese maple blossoms fall perfectly from their branches. A childhood of dream of rooms. I was alone with my own language on a stone bench where I watched large goldfish descend into black water. A childhood of rooms, drawers of pearls in perfumed tissue paper. Though we loved the mystery of sleeping porches in summer and the soothing whistle of trains along the Hudson River, the elegant paper dolls my grandmother made disappeared in the attic prints of women drowning next to sinking ships. My sister's got into yellow cabs of crinolines and tea dances, came home to the top floor of the New York brownstone. We roller skated on the hexagonal paving stones of Fifth Avenue, skate keys dangling from our necks. But even then, I breathed in the sweet smell of death in the Egyptian wing of the Metropolitan Museum when they cut down the vines from the back of the public library on 96th Street, the birds had no home and something ended, singing. At the library for my sister, Kate. Someone is recovering from being hit by a car and is blessing the Lord. Across the street, the poet writes furiously, I nap over a book. Once upon a time, there were three young girls. One fled along the rooftops of Manhattan. One walked in the roads of Woodstock, New York. One tries every day to be worthy of poems that arrive in sweatshirts of long-legged girls or in the enormous roots of the sycamore. The trees say green, more green. The knees say bind me, hold me in place. The heart says more words. Uh, this is a series of poems called Persistent Mockingbird Memory. It's in 10 parts. One, persistent mockingbird memory into the beyond. Teapots on the shelf, decaying leaves, hummingbirds among dead branches. Beauty comes today in a glance to change our lives as motorcycles roar by on a back street of memory. New York City, early 1960s. My bad boy. Two, lesson. At the heart of every essential lesson, tubes feeding water to the roots of cucumber and squash. Absence of darkness, acorn woodpecker, woodpeckers in the pepper tree, squawking. At the Vista House above Columbia Gorge, core fact of beauty, water falling off cliffs in Multnomah Falls. We stood below to watch it while my friend Sandy died in a Los Angeles hospital. Mm. Three, seven ripening cucumbers, a revelation of bird flash and song remind us all the time. Sister Corita Kent, painter of words, the discipline of color, work, struggle, struggle. He sits where I sit, says the poem, dreaming of abundance. Four, daily wind of divinity blows through an open door in my dream, shimmering. My nephew burns his hand on the stove my niece has possible kidney damage. Ned's friend, Eric, is unconscious in the hospital. We all need a nest of prayers and time to recover. 
hand with pen, water flowing from hose to trees. Five. After two and a half hours of fertilizing, I am grateful for shadows and life seen through language. A couch filled with pillows, an acorn woodpecker making his nest in the pepper tree trunk. I consider death under the full moon, but we have what we need. Cucumbers, tomatoes, air. Six. It is time for the doors of June, the door of language, of tomato plants, the door of sacred. Fires are raging in Cajon Pass while a satellite moves further into space, taking photos of Pluto. Seven, the summer triangle of memory. I swung from a rope in the hay barn, our pool, an old bathtub filled with water. In the cool of evening, my grandmother drove us through the Catskills. Tonight, we are in love with tongues on fire in the constellations of grace, brought to us by a smartphone as we stand in the middle of Oak Lawn Avenue, looking skyward. Eight, the work. I sit in the middle of a big city where wildlife and scarves gather around me. Poets smile from the wall. An exhausted squirrel has stretched out on the wet concrete surrounded by hummingbirds. The water seeps into camellia roots at the rate of one inch per hour. Constant maintenance is the name of this game. Rumbling in the sky indicates good ideas, but change, as in withering squash plants, tomatoes which grow slowly on a chunk of ordinary. Diki Searing, the mother of the Dalai Lama, labored all her life, rose at 1 a.m. to make tea and feed the animals, her hair in hundreds of small braids. The work contain, continues in spite of cucumber blight. We save our water daily. Nine, reading the daily poems. Wake up, grab a crutch, and consider the narrative line. I have a wall of vegetables, one of fingers, a wall of thoughts, shatter, shatter. Good night, language. Good night, tongue. Ten. I don't remember the sermon, but later think about the word imaginarium, the construct of our minds, image making in place by age 10. Today I solved two problems, the soaker holes on the camellia trees and the fringe on my crocheted shawl. I clear books off surfaces, get a haircut, type letters, make phone calls, we can do this. We can make our lives. Fringe. Water. And I'm going to end with a series of poems that are based on the poems of the Persian poet Rumi. Each poem is a breath. It wants to be written. Give more of your life to this listening, Rumi. One, a beaded curtain, blue, behind it, the friends. I move into warm arms, nothing there except breath. Two, moonlight from the window. You will find the dream, knit the faded feather, breathe easy. Three, drink carefully. Listen to the far off sound. Four, to find the inside, you must sit. Listen to the voice 
that has begun to speak. Five, read the book of life that has been given to you. This night, this room, there is so much quiet here. Six, here there is music, the deep song. We discipline ourselves to it. We wait. Seven, angels in the doorway carry the weight. Light of candle, light of lantern, street lamps, metro lights, light reflecting off fingernail, tip of pen, wedding ring, Christmas bow, everywhere, light. Eight, give us tongues of light this new year and the mind not to extinguish them. Nine, though we long to linger in sweet presence, the soul is a traveler from there to here and the residence where meanings live is no residence, but constant movement. 10. I lean back into it. Rest. We are embrace. We are gratitude. We are bless. Thank you. That was wonderful, Phoebe. You know, in your poem at the library, which I love you, used the phrase, more words. And that's the way I feel about you. I could just listen to you forever. You you have such compassion and such a, a sense of the nature in the city. Uh, it's sacred light that you deal with. And it just, uh, you know, I just, it seems like I haven't heard you for, for so long, even though it's been not too long, but I just love listening to your your poetry and uh, one of your poems, you say, "I like seeing through words." And you are, you are so tuned in to each minute. You're so mindful of what you are doing, and you just give us all such uh, a sense of camaraderie. And uh, you're you're an inspiration. And I just love your poetry. I could I could go on, but uh, the last thing I will say in one of your earlier poems you read today. You said, we are fortunate to walk these streets in whatever meter we want. And I agree with that. You know, you, you show it right there in your poetry, your vitality, your love of poetry, your mindfulness of the creative act, and you just lift us all up. So thank you very much for such a marvelous reading. I would like to just ask you a thank question you, about any one poem that you would like to choose. What, uh, how do you begin to write a poem? Well, the poem that at the library that you where it says more words, um, I I wrote that I was sitting on a bench by the library, and um, it was this wonderful scene with this huge sycamore outside the South Pasadena Library with these enormous roots that are above ground, and I started to write that poem from that scene. That scene inspired that poem, and I I love it when situations in life inspire me to write poetry. Looking back in your study as a poet, not talking about contemporary poets, but is there one poet, you know, before you and I and Mark came along that is a big influence on you? Uh, I would say William Carlos Williams is a huge influence on me. I love, I love the spare clear uh, clear accessibility and the brilliant pacing of his poems. I love that he insisted on speaking in the American idiom and not the English idiom. And he has been a huge influence on me along with Robert Creeley, who's one of his ancestors. So you know, your poetry, you know, focuses on birding, on family, on retirement, on Cucumbers, <laughs> on, uh, a cucumbers. nature, uh, birds that you see in the city. You always see the nature in the city. And uh, 
you know, in one of your poems, you, you mentioned um, uh, childhood of rooms. And people don't realize how much gold there is in, the, um, in, our, in our upbringing, in our yeah. childhood. There's just so much. And you have such a great memory. And your poem, you know, where you mention your sister and living on the Upper East Side. And it's really a blessing to have you uh, with us each and every time. You, you're so supportive. And you really paved the way for all of us who every once in a while we just get uh, disconnected from what we are, which is right here in this world, in the here and now. And we have such a value, valuable environment uh, wherever we are. And you just remind us to see what's right in front of our eyes, you know, continue to learn poetry and to be conscious and to know the tradition. Because if you know the tradition, you don't repeat old forms and uh, your poetry is not redundant, but it's a new breath. And I'm just so thankful to know you and to have you in our lives. So thank you, Phoebe McAdams for a thank marvelous you, reading. Harry. Our next reading is Mark Edward Rhodes. Mark Edward Rhodes is a poet and playwright who has written 13 plays and three books of poetry. I love his last poetry book, Approaching Darkness, 2016. Mark has always astonished me with his strength of narrative and fine ear for dialogue. Mark begins his poignant into approaching darkness, burning bright, quote, it was three o'clock in the afternoon and it was raining. I was on the other side of the world, wandering, wondering why. Back home, the elephant was in the room, but nobody noticed, end of quote. Later, he writes, quote, a woman hung out the wash as the wind played softly with faint vibrato. A sweet synesthesia prevailed, suggesting the scent of autumn on the tongue. Then the breeze picked up speed, twisting the sheets into elephant flags of surrender, end of quote. The poem, with its suggestion of the war in Vietnam, continues with the death of a man marching and a baby's birth. It ends with love. Mark has such range in his poetry. Some of the themes in his poetry are love and loss, war, nature, Ireland, myths, all told with authenticity, clarity, depth, and heart. A superlative and erudite poet, Mark Edward Rhodes. Well, I just want to say that I'll, I'll always want to read with Phoebe because, I mean, if I'm if I'm hungry, she reads poems about food, and then I I almost have to make up my mind whether to leave the reading and go get something to eat or keep listening. But uh, she's she's the greatest. Uh, 1969, I was uh, in the at the Monterey uh, Jazz Festival, and I got this poem out of it eventually. <clears throat> Jazz. A cool wind, a warning. Behind his shades, he sets out the laughter, glad hands, hallelujahs, and silver shadow symphonies of mild applause. Tonight, he is all law of the jungle, religion of the river. Bird calls and backbeats all out of time as lightning flashes over the peninsula and the horn talks. From silk to shout, green dolphin street, round midnight, the spirit of Charlie Parker hangs like a mosquito net over the bandstand. Miles Davis shines. The pilgrim of pain flits down the alley at 138th Street, past the after hours cats, the humbergs, the high rollers, the panthers and their prey, and one, one and the same, that cast a bad new shadow. All along 8th Avenue, the white horse walks. From up above the wailing sound, the whiskey breath engage in the back room. Uptown, the tenor man jumps the tracks. The rain came down, and the rain came down. Below the cracked black glass, Miles Davis takes a shot at the moon. The saxophone slips, then picks up speed, 
the underpinning thunders, Miles Davis smiles. That's right, Miles Davis smiles. <laughs> Between the, the faints and fighting mad anger of his plane, he keeps an eye on the stingy brim bouncing on his head. The tenor man moves too fast to feel the rain. Miles pivots, Miles bows, rain like stilettos driving down. The crowd running for cover, but only he knows there's no place to hide. Drowning in emotion, he will be finished when he finishes. He is a waterfall. I don't know what this poem is about, but uh, it's one of the first poems I wrote. I think I was 15 years old. Blades. And it's in four parts. A sword descends, a flower falls, its root responds, it blooms again. We are blades, we cut each other. Silence travels fast when you leave without a word. I have heard the moaning of felled trees in a clearing, crying, turning for home. We are blades, we cut each other. The sparrow too young to fly, but old enough to try, he is bound to tumble pushed out by the inward stroke of love. We are blades, we cut each other. The human heart, when true, plays perfect music, and no other edge is as sharp as the human mind. It gets you coming and going. Sparks fly, but no one is to blame. No one is guilty. Each birth holds hands with pain. Each child lies helpless beneath the shadow of a knife. Each one is beautiful, unknowing, sheathed in darkness, but not for long. We are blades and we cut each other. Six haiku for spring. Serious love reborn in the water, fishes, sedges collide there. Papyrus bends in an Egyptian wind, all the pyramids shifting. Remoras of light on an empty blue tennis court, wind kissing the net. Images of green ghosts and of, in, of insignificant insects flood the air. Never have I said a new beginning comes only once until now. Giants are no different. They sleep in the shade of Kilimanjaro. But this poem is, uh, people have always asked, where the hell was Jesus the first 10 years of his life? What was he doing? And uh, some people say he was with the Essenes who lived in the desert. And uh, so this is called the Essene. They lived in caves and mud hovels, ate little and drank even less. They studied the scrolls and kept the silence. Far away in the cities, there was much bloodletting and lamentation. Here, there was no crimson curtain to tempt the soul. Once a woman came into their midst and they did not recognize her as a woman. So she went away and was glad to be gone from them. And one day he arrived and he stayed for over 10 years. And when they could teach him no more about the scriptures, he began to teach them. So they urged him to go down the mountain where he could join the chaos and the killing that went on there every day and getting worse. And so he went down bringing with him a ruthless idealism and an ever knowing conviction matched by a wildfire fire of mercy in his heart. And when they asked him who he was and he told them, I am Emmanuel, I am love. They began to mark him well and murmur among themselves. Three years after he had come in from the desert, they killed him by hanging him on a cross of shame. This was in the springtime 
when all the almond trees were full of leaves. Praising the buffalo below the DMZ. The sunlight like a sickle set at all. Out all week long, hoping for relief. Lost two out of 12 and still the sound of the medivac pounded in his head. With dust everywhere and nobody knowing the way home. Praise be the buffalo, its horns be ribboned with a cat's cradle of red and white and blue bunting, its backside streaked with mud. <clears throat> he walked behind along the highway, hemmed in by, by, his, by hibiscus and many kinds of wild orchids and for miles. After the mango groves had given out, he feared their beauty was a trap and found himself saying the word indomitable several times, until at last he caught his breath and looked up, once again felt the heat slicing down from the sky and the beast of burden stripped of its former raiment, moaned beside the river, blood in its eyes, blood in its mouth. Telemachus is the son of Penelope and Odysseus. Uh, this is uh, my version <laughs> about me this time, uh, Telemachus in Venice. The house is empty throughout the day. My mother works from sunup to twilight. <clears throat> Roses shine outside the living room window. Wild ivy reaches up and down the cross white trellis. The dog sleeps in the shade of the backyard incinerator. I am in my room with my gallant toy soldiers. They are laying siege to Troy, built from an entire set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Such a silent and crouching violence waits outside the thick magenta hued, high and impregnable gate while fire trucks and ambulances whine in the streets. Mother comes home tired, gives me a dollar for dinner, then lies down on the couch. Dad is still out on the road, that endless highway he calls hope for the future or looking for love. A fierce sunlight prints a fiery orange ball in the center of the diaphanous Irish lace curtains. Night plays hide and seek below the twin mile long line, lines of royal palms along Washington Street to the beach. The sound of bongos and a lone recorder find their way over the rooftops of the dilapidated dwellings beside the Grand Canal. I sit on the porch and half listen, watching the minnow mobbed water looking down past the bridges for my father, hoping he doesn't show. This poem is for Steve Goldman. Uh, is this haiku? And I, oddly enough, I got this idea from Italo Calvino, the novelist. Uh, so it's called The Sword and the Leaves. Steve is a uh, swordsman, you know, he's a teacher. The cutting edge sings its wind song softly in the night. There is a rueful misting falling on white gravel. There was no adversary today, but perhaps tonight in dreaming. A mountain of leaves in the yard has been formed into a tall cone. The hilt of the sword rises at its apex. A glint of moonlight shimmers there. The naked blade quivers in its warm bed of leaves, remaining cold. This is an Irish poem. I met this man in the street, he was drunk and uh, got some money off of me, but uh, 
It's called the Dark Looper. A dark looper in Ireland is a you know, people who are in the fields with the with the sheep or with the cows. Uh, the fairies come at night if they fall asleep and puts a bug in their ear, and the bug robs their soul. So I met this young man, and he wasn't well, that young. And the dark looper, there's a couple words in here called the Kruskeen lawn means the full glass. And uh, so it's a, it's a short poem and it actually rhymes. So I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> the dark looper. Fair play to you, you sorry young scamper. You appears to be so troubled and wan. Have you been doing the dirty? Feeling a bit cramper, not taking your vitamins, nursing the Kruskeen lawn. Interfering with yourself, filthy mag on the toilet. Feeling the cherries, the black and the blues at snooker. Feeling the ass end of the joint without the proper to boil it. Now it could be your karma or the creeping dark looper. I'm afraid you must bar that mingy bitch hole by the river. Drop the bad habit bandit at the bedding shop booker. Give up the tobacco, the beer, drugs, and the quiver. Confess to the priest, the mother, the wife, and don't rook her. I'm gonna skip this one. Uh, how are we doing? Uh, this is another poem. Uh, I've, I've heard, I think you've read, heard this before, but I want to read it again. Uh, I was born during the last days of winter. Let's get the ball rolling. Such an odd and playful phrase. Everyone has a ball of some sort, and every ball is a different color. My ball is red and very small. I was born in March, the Martian boy. I loved baseball, I still do. A baseball is white until it gets scuffed. Someone once said baseball is like life, but didn't explain why that was so. Someone else said life is but a dream. To me, that meant it wasn't always real. We all get the ball rolling when we're young. If we're lucky, when we're old, it will slowly come to a stop. Then all will be quiet, hopefully. Then the rose won't require its fragrance. Life is a waiting game, even when you can't feel you've been waiting for anything. What is it? We sometimes wonder. But no one will answer this question. When the ball stops rolling, then we get to know, or else won't get to know, but then it won't matter. I've decided that when that day comes, we will hear a sound from a faraway distance. We will be in a field of wheat ready for the harvest, and the wind will be all around us and within us. Then we will face each sacred direction there, before lying down in a dream among the golden shafts of grain. And then we will disappear to merge into the light of the ancient of days and be still, but still turning there. Some call this place the Oblivion Palace, while many others call it something else. I picked a New York poem. Because Phoebe's here and Harry's here. And uh, so you know this this place I'm gonna talk about now. It's right on the corner. And it's called Eurythmics. Wind music is making the snapdragon sway in modes of jerk and strut. A type of eurythmics, mocking a waltz is taking place. 
pushed by the sound of a recorder or a panpipe playing, as the day slips in and the blossoms calm down for a while. Still, various shuddering, multicolored movements begin bobbing and weaving as if memory would not leave them be. Bees are beginning to congregate. The tulips on Fifth Avenue muster outside the Plaza Hotel, their enormous fragile heads turning yellow and pink the sun, a soft disk of light on the wide sidewalks, the sky simmering anonymously, anonymously. Taxis rumba and right themselves, stopping and starting, darting in and out. That woman walking away in the black skirt takes me with her, a little hip for the trip and a flamboyant shoulder slide. Flags and banners rustle and rip. A large crowd, far distant, unseen, is streaming over the 59th Street Bridge, a serpentine sonata of humanity. They are dancing among the flowers, along the concrete, in the park, by the river. Inside a seascape, never standing still, always moving, fast forwarding without hesitation, the prime mover never stopping for a second the mindless, unknowable cause and rocking horse rhythms of life. That's about it, yes. Well, Mark? Uh, do, you have, do you have time for one more? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a female person in this poem that is not a woman, that is not a, a live thing. Uh, and so the answer to an unasked question, I was in Carmel and this happened to me. And so uh, I, will, I will read it and it'll be the last one. While sitting on a bench above the sea, she came and sat beside me. And together we watched the sky and the sun come down to meet the horizon that never moved as we moved into the dark of darkest night. You are going to be all right, she said. Yes, she said, looking at me. Yes. How do you know this is true, I asked her. And she said, just be still and try not to speak or to move at all. If possible, open your eyes and find something to follow. Clouds, ocean, sun, the birds going by. Time out of time, not of knowing, events out of sequence, rain falling, but not seen to be coming down, the ground wet and warm with the sight and smell of water, rainwater, yes, that was it, a river. It was a long time ago. And then the ineffable, but not in time, no, no prayer was made, never that. But you knew one thing for sure, that you were happy for a moment or two. And then everything was fine. Everything was good. Everything was yes. Everything was just say yes. Well, that was magnificent, Mark. I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I thought I heard you say I. Something like I guess that's. I a, did. I, I'm not all there. Apologize to you, but your your poetry has such great rhythm and observations and tenderness, and you have such range. I mean, you took us, you know, you ended up in Carmel. You uh, took us to New York City, to Vietnam, to Venice, to the jazz festival in Monterey, and you just uh, your poetry is it just has such a deep resonance. You're not afraid of the big questions, you know, questions that each one of us face in our own lives in that poem, you, you get the ball rolling. Well, you always keep that ball rolling and you face, uh, you know, whatever you want to talk about, death, eternity, religion. And uh, it's just really such a pleasure. You, you know, you, you just, um, you know, as Phoebe said, you know, you're one of the hidden gems of uh, LA poetry and American poetry for that matter. I remember the first time I heard you read your 
poetry was in a workshop at, at Beyond Broke in the early 70s, and you read a poem about Vietnam, and you just knocked me out. I thought, this man, has he was there. It's authentic. And then I asked you later on about reading that poem again or other poems about Vietnam, and you said you didn't want to. And, uh, you know, you've been there, and you realize uh, how important uh, – you know what what the you know the immensity of war is compared to our, our writing words but you just really touched me deeply as you always do and uh i want to just ask you two questions and the first question is let's take any one of your poems that you would like to look at and uh what how do you begin a poem uh actually what i do is i, I uh, like Dylan Thomas once said, someone told him that he, he used the same words over and over again. In the, uh, and he says, all your poems are alike. And, uh, and Thomas says, well, my dear sir, you don't understand. I don't write poems. I write poetry. <laughs> a big difference. Okay. I, just, I just write, I, I, I get something pops in my head and I write it down. I have all these notes. And eventually, I could go over them, and then I and then put them together. I'm really completely uh, at sea when it comes to like, okay, now I'm going to write a poem about love. You know, I it just comes out, and uh, and it takes a long time. And some of these poems, I mean, I didn't print them until like 20 years later. Or something like that, because I mean, you get a little scared, you know. You know, you haven't written a poem in a long time. <laughs> Go back to the old stuff, you know. And so, uh, but you know, it's just that. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, Phoebe can write these wonderful poems about nature. I mean, I, I don't know how she does it in such a small space, and it just is so, you know, vibrant. And it doesn't take a lot of a lot of bricks to build her house, you know. I mean, she just does it. And, and Harry, same thing, you know. I mean, same, I don't even want to go into it. But it's just like, uh, you know, you read one of Harry's poems and you figure that was pretty quick, you know, what happened? And then go back and then you see other things. You see how he's building it and you see how he's doing it. Uh, so that's what I think. I, I think it's just uh, magic. In a way, you know, it just shows up, you know. And you're sitting there, you're doing nothing, you know, and someone knocks at the door. I mean, uh, so I, I, that's that's all I know. Yeah. And I'll ask you the second question, the same I asked Phoebe, not talking about our contemporaries, but looking in the past. What one poet would you say was a big influence on you? I, I can't think of just one. I can think of Dylan, think uh, Elliot, and him, and uh, and W. H. Auden. Well, thank you. And and since you said something nice about Phoebe, I know Phoebe. We all love to listen to her talk about poetry. What would you like to say about Mark's poetry, Phoebe? Well, I love. There's this thread of the, I I love the beautiful rhythmic movement of them. And this the sort the deep melancholy th thread that runs through them, but it's so beautifully, so beautifully written. I love the image of you um, standing in a field with the wind blowing inside and outside, and then lying down in the field, disappearing into the yeah whatever. I mean, the image is just beautiful. Right. Watch the end of Gladiator. That's where I got that. Oh, yeah. That's a wonderful ending, that incredible yeah. ending. Yeah. One of the poems that always moves me is Telemachus in Venice, when you talk about the details in your home. Yes. And you're looking for your dad and you say something about um, hoping he does. I think it, the quote is hoping he doesn't show. I'm and waiting yeah. my dad and hoping he doesn't show. And it just yeah. buries yeah. your heart yeah. out. Yeah, it's just so deeply poignant. And as I would like to say, you know, we have one more minute. Actually, it's one fifty nine. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. But I will just say that both of you complement each other so beautifully. And it just opens up so many avenues for all of us just to feel and to 
and to see the possibilities. And uh, both of your poetry is so filled, filled with sacred light and, and both of your poems, your poetry, uh, you know, are regenerative. So thank you once again for both of you. Such a All magnificent right. reading. And I'll turn it over to Jennifer Clymer. Thank you, Harry. And thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer.